I want us to read from Ecclesiastes chapter 4. You're unsure where it is? Just uh, if you get to Psalms and Proverbs, just keep going over and you'll, you'll get to Ecclesiastes. This is probably one of the better known uh, passages out of the book of Ecclesiastes, apart from Solomon's repeated use of the phrase as it was in the King James Version of the Bible where it said vanity of vanities all is vanity and vexation of spirit I sort of love it, it has a good sort of ring to it of emptiness and that was where Solomon was at when he was writing Ecclesiastes it was sort of coming from a very human perspective but I want to pick it up from Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9 two are better than one because they have a good return for their work if one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. <clears throat> this is a scripture which is frequently used at weddings. When people, Christian, a Christian couple are coming together in marriage and the, the threefold cord or the threefold strand is the husband or the bride, the groom and, and God who is being brought into that relationship. And that's a nice application of the, of the scripture but that's not what, what uh, Solomon had in mind when he was primarily writing it. He was talking about a relationship between two people and he, he makes the makes the point that it's it's better to have a team of people doing something than it is to be on our own Robert Crosby has said that a triple braided cord model reflects the central image of the Trinity this is another concept that that the the threefold cord can have at least in a couple of ways one he says is a clear picture of the strength that comes from the teaming together of two or three persons. This is the manner in which God has revealed his nature from the outset of creation. Not as an individualistic deity, but as a God in community, the Trinity at work. Secondly, he says that the three-part chord represents not only an effective team, but also a team that has more than one person to share the satisfaction of accomplishment of accomplished work and goals. Remember, even the Trinity, amidst its work, paused to enjoy the goodness and pleasure of it. And in the scripture, Solomon is really highlighting four things which come out of, out of this in relationship of these, of this, uh, in terms of this relationship that we have with one another. He cites greater productivity. They will accomplish more than twice as much as one. There will be greater results get a better return, they get a better return for their labour. There's greater security. If one falls, the other can help. And two can stand back to back and conquer. He also notes that the addition of another team member is an even greater benefit. Three are better than two. And this was a, a concept that, that was coming together and and then I started reading a book by <coughs> Jensen Franklin on fasting. And uh, he, he brings out another picture of a threefold cord. And that's the picture I want to develop today and next week. And it's not so much the relationship of three people, but as he brings it out, it's the relationship between three significant kingdom keys that can be incorporated and should be incorporated in our daily walk and our Christian experience. He goes to the Sermon on the Mount and sees this threefold cord that Jesus was bringing together. Today I want us to look at just two of them and next, next week I want to pick up on the third. The first two that we're going to look at really are reviewing things that we have talked about frequently or from time to time in previous, uh, on previous occasions. The third one next week is one which we haven't probably talked a lot about and so therefore we're going to spend a whole session on that. So if you've still got your Bibles open, um, if we go to Matthew chapter 6, 
where Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount and he is going to be teaching us what these three keys are and they need to be worked simultaneously in our lives. They need to come together in our experience for them to have the power and the impact that, they, that I believe Jesus was wanting them to have when he gave this Sermon on the Mount. Let's look at the first one in chapter 6 and verse 1. He says, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honoured by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Over in verse 19, he, carries, he picks this theme up a little bit more, and he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I don't suppose there's a, a week goes by when we aren't encountered by um, somebody who is, is asking for donations for some very worthy cause. They'll either knock on your door, you'll get a phone call. And I don't know how you feel about that, but I... <laughs> I get all sort of knotted up inside because I know that it's a worthy cause. I know it's something that they probably don't get major grants for. But I know that I can't give to everything and everyone who comes to me. And so there's some choices that, that have to be made for that. And it's, it's even technology now has, has really helped us on this. You, you can get the, get the call. It'll, you'll be watching the the news and, and there will be a major disaster such as we've had in, in Fiji in these, in these recent weeks. And Oxfam or, or one of these really great organisations will, that, that will come across and the, the people reading the news will, will tell you now if you, if you just dial this 0800 number and uh, you can give an automatic $3 donation. And it's so easy to do that. And Jesus in this sermon is highlighting a particular aspect of giving and he's talking about our giving to the poor, those who are in real needs. And that's why these, these particular um, organisations are, are so worthy because they are seeking to help those who are way, way, way less fortunate than what we are. And it was a problem that that Jesus saw with the religious leaders and the religious people of his generation who would be doing their normal giving. But when it came to the special giving, they wanted to really parade it. They wanted to be seen as the real carers of, of the needy. And so they would be making sure that people knew exactly what they were giving and how much they were giving and that they were really generous and kind people. Later on in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus picks this up with them and he says, What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites! For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. And Jesus was saying, while you've, you've got this, this standard giving of tithing, there is also the need to think about these other, other opportunities. The tithe was introduced by Abraham before the law came in. Then it was adopted by the children of Israel through the law as a, as a starting point of, for, for their giving under God's further direction. Jesus endorsed the tithe. When he, was, when he was here and he was challenged by the religious leaders in Mark chapter 12 and, and they said, should we pay taxes? And so Jesus said, give me a coin whose image is on it. And they said, Caesar's image. And he said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. 
So what did the Pharisee, what did the Pharisee understand by that statement? You have to pay your tax. That is a legitimate call on your, on your finances. And the part which is God's was the initial tithe of their income. The top 10% of their income. That was God's part that they were to, to give. So Jesus was saying, this, was, this is part of your normal giving. But you need to also understand that there is a need that can go beyond that. Everyone knew that these religious leaders were tithing. That was part of what was the expectation. But what they were doing was just showing off and letting everyone know just how generous they were in the area of voluntary giving to the poor. And he calls them hypocrites. Now, could that money be used to the poor? Of course it could. Would the poor be blessed and helped as a result of that? Of course they would. But Jesus is saying, it's the attitude of your heart in doing that that is saying, it's all wrong. And he said, you are hypocrites. In the, in the um, Greek understanding of, of a hypocrite, it was somebody, it was a word that was used rather for an actor who wears a mask. It's somebody who is portraying a role which isn't actually them. So as you go to the theatre and you go to the movies and you see people acting out stuff, they're all a bunch of hypocrites. Because they, in, in a good sense, that's, that's, that's what they, how they would have been understood. That was what their profession would have been called. Actors wearing a mask, displaying something of who they aren't in, in real life. And, and Jesus was saying, you're trying to give an impression here of, of being a religious, a God-fearing person, and you're trying to give that, but in your heart you're not, because all you're wanting is to hear all these people who walk past say, oh, good man, oh, that was so cool, that, you're just so generous. Oh, you must be a really, really special person to be able to, to do it. And when they got that, they got the, got the praise, they got what they were actually looking for. Warren Wisby has given them the description that, uh, of it is when he says that deliberately using religion to cover up their sins or to promote their own gain. Now some of you may have heard uh, in talking to friends and, and they're, they're raising their objections about, about Christianity or about the church and they, it's sort of like a, a one-liner, a throwaway comment that they will just say, well, the, whole, the church is just full of hypocrites. Anyone had that? Yep. Church is just full of hypocrites. Well, in actual fact, they are wrong. The church is full of ordinary people like us who have in, in our hearts the passion to want to serve God, to please God, to worship God. But along the line, we, we mess up. We say things, we do things, we act in ways which don't reflect what is, in our, what is really in our heart. But are we in those slip-ups trying to say to people, look, I, I'm actually a better person than I really am? Are we trying to present, uh, present a, a lifestyle that we aren't? No, we, we, we're, we're tripping up. And of course they see the trip up and they say, well, you, you say you're a Christian, but look, how, look at that. You, you know, Christians wouldn't do that. And we say, no, that's right, Christians don't, and I shouldn't have. But that's not my heart. It's the person who, who wants to be, to be seen as a Christian, to do all the good things, but really is not living the Christian life. That person is the one who is the hypocrite. And what these people had to realize that no amount of giving to the poor was going to, to give them a ticket or an access or, or a, a, a availability to get into heaven. God was not impressed with that giving in the, uh, when the motive was wrong. And, the key to, uh, and that's the key to Jesus' teaching here. If the giver is giving in order to impress people and trying to impress God, they have a wrong motivation in that. But if we're giving from a pure motive, if we're wanting to serve and please God with our giving, then God will see that and God will bless that. One thing which we've been told and we're, we're just thinking about it again on the weekend, this, this concept that you cannot outgive God. You cannot outgive God. Sometimes we're a little bit afraid to give. Sometimes we might even be a little bit afraid to start tithing our income because we, we think we're not going to be able to live on 
if we give God 10%. And that's to say, well, God's not faithful to, to who he is because he won't allow you to suffer at his expense. Now, how that works, God only knows how that works. How he makes up that 10% that you have given in order that you might be able to still meet your commitments. It's been our experience for a lifetime to see that we've never gone without a meal, we've never gone without being able to pay our rent, we've never gone without anything which is le le legitimate and needed, and we've needed, simply because our giving has started with the tithe. So is it wrong to give God, give gifts openly? Because he says here that if you should be giving in secret, is, that, is it wrong to... To, to let people know or to, for people to be aware of what we've given? No, it's not. Not necessarily. When you come into the book of Acts, you, dis you discover that everyone knew that Barnabas in Acts chapter 4 had sold a block of land and he had bought the proceeds of that land and given it to the church, given it to the apostles so that they could use it for the, for the work of the kingdom of God. In, in uh, later chapters too, we found that other church members had sold land and come and laid the money at the apostles' feet. Everybody knew that that's what, what had happened, but it wasn't that they were going to be seen to be getting the glory and the good of that. They were doing it to bless, and they're doing it out of a pure motive. In Acts chapter 5, you find a couple who had an impure motive, and they sold their block of land, and they were going to give this because that was something they felt that they could do. But they thought they'd hoodwink the apostles and God in the process and would, would hold some back for them, but present the amount as being this was the total proceed of what we got for our land. But God was one step ahead of them. He knew that wasn't the case. And when Ananias comes and he presents it, and they said, is this what you get, got for your land? And they said, yes. And God said, zap, you've gone. So they went and buried him. And then his wife comes in, and, and, and she has the same story. And you know, that, that's the full amount. That's what, that's what we got for the land. And she got zapped, and they went and buried her. It's interesting, you see, people say, it'd be love, it'd been great to have lived in the church in, those, in that first century. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure, you know, I, I just, I like this idea of forgiveness and grace. And, but God was teaching the church something. He wanted integrity in the hearts of his people in those very early days. And he still wants that today. So the spirit of giving and a pure motive is seen in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, where they, the church in Macedonia was giving out of their poverty. This was an extra giving. This, is one, this wasn't their normal giving. This was an extra offering that they were taking up to meet the needs of the Christians in Jerusalem who were suffering because of a famine. And so everybody knew. Paul had reminded them. He said, oh, you said you were going to do it. He said, I'm passing through. I'm going to collect it on my way through and I'll take it down to, uh, down to Jerusalem. So the first strand of this threefold cord is a spirit of generosity. The second strand is in chapter 6, verses 5 to 15. Let's just turn over there. Chapter 6, verse 5, he says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. And I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for the Father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. This is probably the best known prayer in, in, of any religious group whatever. Known to us, of course as the Lord's Prayer. 
when Luke introduces it in Luke chapter 10, he, he introduces it as, as a request that came from the disciples. They had seen the life of Jesus. They would seen how often he went to pray. They would seen that, that prayer was a significant part in his life. And they, they knew that there were the prayers of the Pharisees and they had their ritual prayers and they had all the, all the, all the systems that went around that. But somehow the, the authentic nature of Jesus' prayers just said something different to them. And they knew that as they looked at him, there was something lacking in their own lives. So they said to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray that we might be able to pray as you pray. So what, what do you do? And I take it that what Jesus gives here is the, is the model prayer that he prayed. Because it's interesting, he, he says that this is, this is not what you pray, this is how you're to pray. And he says if you want to pray, and, and a lesson for us is that if we want to learn to pray in public, we need to be praying first in private. You're not going to be able to talk to God publicly if you don't know how to talk to him in your own private devotional life. And so it's coming to terms with that. Jesus, Jesus calls prayer, prayer done in, in a false way hypocrisy. But prayer that is done out of a pure and genuine heart is prayer that honours him. These people wanted to be seen for their public prayers and Jesus was saying, no, you've got it wrong. You might sound very flowery and very, very eloquent, but I see your heart. And God isn't looking for our eloquence. When we have, we, and from time to time, we have times in our service where we, we open it up for people to bring prayers of praise, worship, petition. And I know some of you are probably sitting, I can't pray. You'll hear somebody pray, oh man, I wish I could pray like that. They're so, they're so good with words. But that's a blessing that God has given them. And he's saying, don't, don't try and copy somebody. I want a relationship from you that's genuine to you. Speak to me like you speak to me. And if you're stammering out just a few words of, Lord, I love you, and I haven't got a clue what else to say, he says, that's all I need to hear. That's all I need to hear. Just say that. And as you start to say that more often, then you'll start to find something else to add to that, some other characteristic of Jesus that you love and you worship and you, you thank him for that. And so it starts to build on that and so it, it grows. But you see, if we're not doing that in our private life, we'll never know how to do that when we're with, within a group. He wants our prayers to be genuine and authentic. He said vain words and babbling intercession are descriptions of thoughtless prayers. When we're just prattling off stuff, it might be stuff that we've known and, and it's, it's just coming out the top of here. It might be a memorized prayer and we think, well, if I've got to pray, this is, this is a good one I learned about 30 years ago. I'll, I'll just keep trotting, trotting that one out. It's vain repetition, just babbling on. But then does repeating memorized prayers really always count for nothing? It does if it's done without thought or faith. But if we come with a prayer and, and with, it's coming from a genuine heart to want to seek the heart and mind of God, he knows the heart. You see, he looks at the heart more than he listens to the words. The words are what we use. But God's looking at the heart and he wants to see what comes from the heart. It's a genuine fellowship and communion with God. Prayers need to reflect God's will and purpose. In verses 9 to 13, this was the disciples' prayer. This is how you should pray. He, said, he didn't say this is what you should pray. See, this was a prayer that, that I learnt when I went to high school. Now, I'd been brought up in a Christian home. I'd had prayers and Bible reading. I'm sure as I was, I was being nursed by my mum, she was, she, the Bible was sort of coming, coming through somewhere in the milk, I'm sure. But it was, it was only when I got to high school that I actually learnt this prayer. And that was because all my pagan mates around me, because we had assembly every day and we had, we had prayer every day at school in those days and there was a Bible reading every day at school in those days. This was high school. My how things have changed. But, and I'd hear my mates quoting this prayer around me and I thought, hmm, they, they know this prayer. And I learnt the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer from, from these mates. But all of a sudden I realised this is, this is just one of those rote things. It's just a ritual that we, we go through. But each part of this prayer 
is a hook on which we can hang our thoughts and our prayers. And that's why I think Jesus used this. Because I think as he went through this prayer, and parts of it in particular would have been appropriate for him. And he, he has a look at it and he listens to it and he prays it. And so he says to the disciples, when you pray, this is how you should pray. And he covers a whole variety of topics. He's saying, let's start off with worship. Our Father who is heaven. Father, who's Father? That's God. What do we know about God? What, what are the attributes of God that, we, that just stir our heart, that we've sung, how great is our God? And you go out on a beautiful cloudless night like we've had recently and you can look up into the heavens and you see the stars and, and that's, just, that's just a speck of what God's put up there. And then you, you, you go online and you pull up the Hubble telescope site and you see the amazing stuff which they've pulled in from the Hubble telescope and that's just getting a bit of a scratch on the surface of what he's doing but at least it's a little bit better than just seeing a, a little speck of light up in the sky and say well God made that yeah well I've got lights here and it looks a bit like that but when you look at the Hubble telescope site and you see the, 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 the variety and the magnificence of it you know, how God did that when I say our father whew, man, he, he has done all of that and, and, and we could go on about, about the whole creative work of God. Then he says, honour God. Our Father who is hallowed be your name. What are the names of Jesus and of God and of the Holy Spirit that we know? He has got scores of names. And you see, our name identifies us. I am Russell with two L's. I've been waiting for a long time to get that across. You'd be surprised how many times I get, Dear Russell, one L. I don't know who that guy is. Anyway, Russell, <laughs> Russell identifies me. All right? I'm not Greg. I'm not Steve. I'm Russell. And you are who you are. And when, when your name is called, you know that's you. And God has given us in his word by his spirit a multiplicity of names that when we know them, we can call him by name in a particular circumstance. When, when um, Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, and he gets him up onto the altar, and he's just holding the knife about him, and all of a sudden there's a name of God that comes out of that experience, which changed Abraham's life forever. And I'm sure he would never, ever forget it. It was Jehovah Jireh, our God provides. God provided a lamb in place of Isaac. You've got needs. Social needs, physical needs, emotional needs, spiritual needs. Who better to go to than Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And we call him by name. And he hears us when we do that. Then there are causes of evangelism and justice, compassion, surrender. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Prayer for our daily needs, our, our, our daily experiences. And we might not need to pray specifically at this point for a meal at lunchtime and another meal at tea time or one or two meals in a day because of our culture. But every one of us has daily needs that often we're crying out to God for. It might be a social need. It might be a friendship. It could be an emotional need. We're, we're breaking down. We're, we're, we're broken people and God wants to come into that need. And we can cry out to him and he knows our daily needs and he will meet those daily needs. Then there's forgiveness. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our trespasses, depending on your translation, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. That's a, that's a, that's a, a hard part in this prayer. Because what we've said is, forgive us our debts. And there's a, there's a little word that I wish wasn't there. As. If only we could get rid of as, it would be all right. If we could just leave it as, forgive us our debts, forgive me my trespasses. I'd be sweet with that. But he goes and puts in this as in the next clause that follows that. 
as I forgive those who trespass against me. Why did you have to say that? I just... And he says, because if you've experienced forgiveness from me, you need to give forgiveness. And if you can't, if you can't receive, if you can't give forgiveness, have you received it? Because one is a demonstration of the other. And deliverance. Deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from temptation. Deliver us from what the enemy is going to put around us. You see, by the time you get to this part in this, in this disciples' prayer, you're starting to think of the wonder, the glorious magnificence, the provision of God, the, the, the interest and care that he has for you. And, and so we get down to this point, and when it comes to temptation, you're going to think, that is going to look so unholy compared to the, the, the life which we've just been, we've been worshipping, the God we've just been worshipping. Why would I want to give in to, to a temptation for a moment's pleasure, a moment's satisfaction, when I've just been in the worshipping this amazing, awesome God? I'd... So when he's saying, deliver us from that, he's saying, I already have. Just walk in my deliverance. Walk in fellowship with me. And some of the translations, as the NIV doesn't have it, as, as I read this morning, misses out what I, what I always put in normally. I didn't do it when I was reading it because it wasn't directly in the text. But in the footnote at the bottom of the page, it said, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And it's as if he's, Jesus if, is saying, let's go right back to the top again. You started in worship Let's end up now with praise and thanksgiving. Yours is the kingdom, not mine. Yours is the power, not mine. Yours is the glory, not mine. Forever and ever, amen, I can say amen to that. So when you're thinking about prayer and how you can pray and how you can invigorate your prayer life, think about this prayer. Open up to Luke or Matthew 6 here. And just go through it, using them as, as hooks. You'll notice in the prayer too that he doesn't use personal pronouns, a singular personal pronouns. It's a plural one. He says, our father, our sin, our temptation. It's, 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 we're in this together. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. So there's a sense of community in this prayer as well. As you think about the 50-day prayer adventure that we're, we're talking about starting after, after Easter, this may be a pattern prayer that you want to work through and use in those times. Matthew 6, at the end of the chapter, he says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. The things which you would worry about, the things which would be a pressure for you. He said, Seek me first, and I'll take care of the other things. Again, Warren Wesby says that prayer is the God-appointed way to have your needs met, and it prepares us for the proper use of the answer. And then he says, Pray with a forgiving heart. This is in the 40 verses 14 and 15. It's like a footnote to the prayer, recapping on the emphasis that he's, that he's made as well. This is something I need to be reminded of, something perhaps you need to be reminded of as well. We don't earn God's forgiveness. It comes to us as we lay our sins before him. But we demonstrate that we have been, that we've received God's forgiveness as we start to forgive others you see the underlying basis for prayer is fellowship Ephesians 4.32 says be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other just as Christ has forgiven you Colossians 3.13 make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you remember the Lord forgave you so you must forgive others our fellowship with God and with each other comes out of a spirit of 
forgiveness. We see that in the parable of the unmerciful servant in Matthew chapter 18. See, the reality is that unforgiveness is a sin. It's a sin that grieves God and breaks fellowship, which weakens the effectiveness of our prayer life. Perhaps this may be something special that the Holy Spirit does on us as a church as we go through this 50-day prayer adventure. People are saying, what, what is God going to do? What are we expecting God to do during those 50 days? I'm expecting God to do what God wants to do. And if that's, that's challenging my heart with a spirit of forgiveness, as he's saying to the church, we need to have a greater spirit of forgiveness, and he pours that spirit into us, I'd say praise God for that. That's what God is about. And you've received um, a, a card in the post. You've received a card on your, on your seat. And I want to give you an opportunity to, to fill that card in today. To make a commitment today that when you want to participate in this prayer adventure. And I know some of you have thought about it because I've talked to some of you and you've talked to me about it. And, and in the journal that, that we're giving out to everybody, uh, I've, I've listed some things which are challenges for us. We, we can get, we're going to say, some of us are going to say, it's too hard. Half past six to half past seven in the morning, that, that, I, that no, I just can't, can't do that. I'm too busy. Life's too full. I can't add anything more to my schedule. I've never done it before. I'm not into prayer and fasting, so don't count me out. I've got a line, you just fill in the blank if there's something that's not there, which is why you think you can't do it. But I'm going to tell you why we need to do it comes out of an experience that we've had just this weekend if I can hold it together the elders have been away Friday night last night we drove in from Castle Point this morning having had a wonderful day together yesterday just talking together about church about where we're going praying together laughing together crying together we had a time when we started to share some of the stuff in our hearts and lives that we're going through at the moment. Kevin and Judith shared something of the experience of their lives over the last few months. It was harrowing. I think for any lesser couple, they would have bombed out a long time ago. And they've stayed faithful to their roles in this church despite the pain and the the difficulties and the crises that they've challenged, that they've faced. We cried with them over that, prayed with them. Came in this morning expecting that we're going to have, everyone's going to be here, it's going to be great. Kevin on his way in this morning, hears that his son, who's given them grief from when he was a kid, is now in major trouble. Kevin can't be here today because he's with his son. And I say, why do we need to spend 50 days together in prayer? Because we've got brothers and sisters in this church whose hearts are breaking, whose lives are facing a tremendous crisis, and, and we need to be in prayer to support them. I'm sorry, I just... This isn't to put a guilt trip on you. This isn't... I just want us to know to be praying for each other. And if that's all we do when we come together for the days in this 50 days, that, and God can do stuff through that, we're asking you to, to think about two days in the week, each week that you could commit. could be one day during the week and one day on the weekend. 6.30 to 7.30 during the week, 7 to 8 on the weekends. Let God do what God wants to do amongst us. Some of us have got children that are not walking with Jesus. And our hearts break for them every day because we'd love to see them following Jesus. Some of us have got husbands or wives that aren't following Jesus. They've never surrendered to him and your hearts break. You'd love to see them come to know him. Do we care about that as a fellowship? Does that, does that break our heart? Does that do anything for us? We're really saying out of the 366 days of 2016, give us 14 days to pray. Out of, the, out of the 50, 
you want to come for more, I'm not stopping you. I'm not saying don't. You might only be able to come for one, but take, make a step, take a step, make a commitment. Say, this is when we can do it. Now, I think I'm coming right. Um, we know that there, we cover a tremendous area. Masterton, Carterton, Greytown, Featherston. And I don't expect that people from Featherston are going to drive up for half past six or from any of the other outlying districts. But it may be that somebody in that district, somebody in that community is going to put their hand up and say, if you meet at my house on this morning or on these mornings, we will join with the, with the others in prayer. That's a challenge. We can do that. So I would encourage you. I'm going to give you a moment or two now to look at those, those cards, see what, you can, see what you can do. I've got some pens for those who haven't got pens. We talked last Sunday about doing a new thing. At the lighthouse, God is doing a new thing. I believe it's starting right here, right now. As you take, take a pen, make a comment. When you have filled it out, if you like to pass them to the aisles and if somebody would like to just gather them in, you'll see we've got options there, Monday, Sunday to Saturday. But come on your own, come with your family, your spouse, your children, come with your life group. Come with your, with your ministry team. Come with a friend. Any combination of the, of the above. But just come. Just come. And you might be able to come for a quarter of an hour. You might be able to come for half an hour. We'll have breakfast. It'll be, won't be sort of hash browns, spaghetti, bananas, all, all, the, fruit, all, the, all the goodies. It will be simple, basic. Wheat bix, cereal, toast, coffee, tea. You can grab a bit on your way out. You can take some when you come in. We can sit and eat breakfast and pray. God is not going to judge us if we're eating breakfast and praying at the same time. Please pray for Kevin and Judith today. They are a faithful couple. They have been faithful in leadership for a number of years and they need our support. Father, we, we hold in our hands here really the first fruits of, of people making this initial commitment to, to this exciting 50-day prayer faith adventure that you have directed us into. And Father, I bring these cards before you today, the names of the people here. You know their hearts. I pray that you will bless them Make it possible for them to make the, the necessary changes in their lives to, to let this fit in comfortably into their lifestyle over this eight-week period. And may they know, as they make this special commitment, that your hand of blessing is upon them. We would ask you to bind the strong man who would come against them, who would seek to derail them, who would seek to... I'll put obstructions in their path that, that he will not have access into their homes into their lives to, to prevent this from happening for them Lord do it for your glory and for your glory alone for others Lord who are still contemplating it still wondering how they can make it fit what God can work Lord I pray that you'll really by your spirit give them a strong conviction of how they can participate in this and we give you thanks for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.